Uh, now, listen, last week, David Checkley, a man described by police as the most prolific and heartless romance frauder that they'd ever encountered, was jailed for 11 years. Found guilty of 19 counts of fraud, Checkley had scammed 10 women out of more than £100,000 before he was finally brought to justice. And two people who sadly know what it feels like to be a victim of this kind of deception are Cecilia Filhoy and Anna Rowe. Both experienced betrayal on a massive level by someone they trusted and are calling for greater support for romance fraud victims and have joined forces to help others like them. Well, they join us now to tell, share their stories. Welcome, ladies, to the both of you. Um, you. Cecilia, a lot of people will be familiar with you from the Tinder Swindler, yeah. the big hit that everyone was watching at the time. But for those that haven't seen the show, can you just explain what happened? Yeah, I was on Tinder. That was the, <laughs> the yeah, name. That's the clue. Close <laughs> that's the, the clue. I was on Tinder. Just moved to London and I was just swiping back and forth and then I matched up with this man that I thought looked really handsome and his name was Samuel Levi. We met very quickly here in London actually for a coffee and he said he was the CEO of a big diamond company. He had so many people around him, business partners, personal assistants, I met his daughter, you know, like this was a proper, you know, like the life that he had online was the life that was he had in real. Yeah. You Well, the first date he took me on, on a private jet, so wow. that is kind of of these infamous private jets. Uh, and you trip. did as many background checks as you could, right? Yeah, as, as, as you do before. Like, the Instagram was there, he was tagged as Samuel Levi, like, everything kind of checked out. But he had a bodyguard, and he said they had been doing really well uh, with the kind of job that he was doing, which was, you know, getting new deals and everything with this diamond company. And unfortunately, after I had become his girlfriend, really trusted him, he came into more problems, where he had his competitors were coming up with death threats and wanted him to stop traveling around and stop doing his job so he was, he was loose so on tracks. Yeah. yeah. And this isn't just what he's telling you. There is proof, there is pictures, there is... I mean, the whole scenario is very real. It's not just created. Like, I, I, I have still so many questions. He had an app on his phone that was showing, like, breaking into his apartment with yeah. CCTV. Like, it was, it was just really, really weird. And after a while, like, things weren't getting better, you know, at the start everything is going to be fine, but it wasn't. So he asked me if he, if I had a credit card, because he was, um, his security team was refusing him to use his credit cards, because they could see where he was in the world by the spend on his card. And obviously that's your partner, who you trust, that yeah. you've seen. You're like, yeah. absolutely, baby. And he had it. a security team. Like, he was the CEO of a big diamond company. Everyone was listening to him. He was the boss. So I felt like, you know what's right to do in this situation. It's just going to be two weeks, going to give you my credit card under Cecilia Fjellhoy, so you can travel safely. So the money was safety. Yeah. Mm. A lot of people were asking, how did you give him so much money? But the money was never the issue here. Yeah. It was the safety that he needed. But of yeah. course, things never went better. He created immersive theaters around me, said that the enemies had found <laughs> him when we were in his apartment in Amsterdam. We had to hide. It was terrible. Like he, his bodyguard was attacked in Copenhagen and they had found him. So I was properly scared. He made me make my Instagram private because they would find me. You believed everything. And I was working full time at this time. So it is the rat wheel where there's so many messages mm. and I had to call the banks all the time to ask them to unblock the card because it was blocked, you know, when he was trying mm. to use it all yeah. over the world it was it was a mayhem when I look back on it and after everything is said and done I had taken over nine loans and over two hundred thousand pounds in debt so at you, the time and simultaneously this was happening to other women with him yeah. as well but I think I was the money I think I was the money pig at the time yeah I do need to quickly say though obviously <laughs> from a legal point of view yeah. we do have a response from Simon Simon says after the Netflix film was released uh, he did take to Instagram to say I will share my side of the story when I've sorted out the best and most respectful way to tell it that's all we've got yeah. to say there but obviously in, in your opinion and from what happened you lost out on a lot of money and you were a victim of romance fraud. Yeah. And you're not the only one. Anna, it's lovely to see you again. Um, we've spoken before about yeah. this. Just for those who don't know, tell us a little bit about your experience. So mine was a different kind of romance fraud. It was a non-financial one. So the intent behind mine, the motivation behind it was sexual, but also the power and control that he had over his victims. He obviously got a real kick out of that. Um, but as with all romance fraud victims, the commonality is the process that we're put through. So it's very specific, a grooming process, love bombing, trauma bonding, mm. and coercive control. Mm. And it's that that makes a victim compliant and complicit in yeah. what's going on in that relationship, whatever the intention behind that is. Mm. 
So. And through the devastation that you've both experienced separately, you have come together to try and make a real difference for other people that may be yeah. facing this. So how did you meet? I think after the Tinder swindler blew up, you know, I was approached <coughs> by doing romance fraud webinars and like kind of get more of the, the word out about this yeah. type of crime. And I met Anna during one of the webinars. Yeah. And then I decided that I wanted to move permanently here to the UK. And I heard so much great stuff about Anna. Like she has catched the catfish online and had done amazing work. And I was like, I need to talk to this woman <laughs> and figure out how maybe we can make something together. So we met up and our yeah. thoughts just aligned. Yeah. And Anna, what is it that you two have now set up together? So based on what I've been doing for six years, helping victims, which has been like a really brilliant pilot for us, mm. um, we are now expanding out and been really fortunate to be asked to go and speak to police at forge conferences. And we're educating people and changing the narrative around romance forge, changing the stigma. We need to think about the language that's used that isolates victims further. Yeah. Scammers isolate victims anyway, and society isolates victims further. Well, you so, say that. I mean, you've, when you went for help uh, to police or, or, or anyone that could help, it was always like, well, there's nothing we can do. It's your boyfriend. Like, yeah. he's not really doing anything wrong from what we could really yeah. go for at the moment. That's right. And when it is an in-person fraud like Cecilia's and like mine, they consider it to be um, domestic yeah. or that it needs to be a civil matter. And that's where the education comes in, mm. not only for police, financial institutions, but also legal representatives yeah. as well but as well like people real proper support like when both of this happened to us we had nowhere no, to go there's not there's not one organization that's particular for romance fraud here in the uk mm. so that is what we want to be so they know where to go because we have victims coming directly to us they're so called? ashamed love, love said. said love said love said love said so what yeah. advice would you give for um, people who think they might be in the same situation as you two found yourself in and also for the for the friends and family of people who mm. might be worried about somebody that they think might be in this situation what are the warning signs how can you help them i think as we've seen in, in the Tinder swindler, is the love bombing, that things are getting serious very <coughs> quickly and you feel that you met your soulmate on so many levels that they actually know you. Yeah. So be careful of that. And if your friends and family, like you have to take them on a journey. If you go there directly and says you're being defrauded and the stigma in society is that you're stupid if you're being there, you are not taking that in as much as you should. Mm. So you need to kind of, as Anna is doing, giving them those tiny, tiny bits of, you know, do reverse image searches, you know, yes. check their profiles, you know, check their Instagram, what are the likes? Yeah, you can. Yeah, it's um, sometimes with victims, the best way to try and help them come out of it is just planting seeds of doubt. Right. So then they tend to go and start checking for themselves. And it's then when they're discovering those things for mm. themselves that they remember what's been said and that helps to bring them out. Because it's not always easy, is it, no. to tell somebody what you think of the Especially person. Especially if someone's in love. <laughs> they're and, saying, and sometimes yeah. they're, yeah, you, they you cannot see it. love blind, I suppose, is yeah. the best way to put it. It is being love blind. It is being love blind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Anna, we've spoken before, and obviously referencing your story, I mentioned the police. We did have a, a, a right reply from the police. Uh, and uh, Detective Inspector Richard Palmer of Kent Police said, whilst Kent Police sympathises with the woman's circumstances, <clears throat> as there was no suggestion he did so for financial gain, it did not constitute a romance fraud or any other criminal offence. All evidence was submitted to the Crown Prosecution Service, which ruled the case did not meet the evidential test for prosecution and no charges were authorised. Obviously, we have to read that out. But your stories, uh, they're fascinating, for want of a better term. And are you both happy now? We're happy having found each other and the help that our stories yeah. have been yeah. giving people. And I think that is the thing. Like, it's one thing what happened to us, but we really, really yeah. want to create proper change and be there for people who feel hopeless. Yeah. So we're happy now. We're moving forward. We are. And we have big plans, so... This is what survivors look like. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and we're turning it into a positive, hopefully, yes. for many people. Not, here, not all heroes wear capes, I see. <laughs> we get a nice couple of capes afterwards. Very, very Thank true. You. So Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.